for joining me and for today's exploration we're going to be looking at Washington DC the District of Columbia the geographically isolated piece of land that the capital of the mighty United States the great state sits upon Washington is a very intriguing exploration as it has many different accounts towards its original founding and the historical construction of many of the elaborate buildings that now dot the Washington landscape what's the real story behind this rather unique city and more so the so-called District of Columbia, the piece of land that it sits upon. In this exploration, we're going to examine the official historical account, and we're also going to look at some of the elaborate architecture that exists in Washington, D.C. This should be a very enjoyable exploration as we get to look at the foundation of the National Mall. Let's begin. It's very interesting to consider that the original bird's eye view of Washington, D.C. was not composed or available until the early 20th century, indeed the 19-teens. And here we see all the familiar and recognizable landmarks of the Washington Mall, whether you're familiar with Washington, D.C. or not. You have the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, the United States Capitol, and we see that even in the early 20th century there were many large and elaborate buildings that dotted the Washington, D.C. landscape even the great train station and the other large buildings. Well, it makes sense because this is the capital of, at that time, what was becoming a world power. Indeed, historical circles recognize the United States' ascension to world power designation after the Spanish-American War, which transpired in 1898, according to the official history. But looking at the numerous key features and the known landmarks within Washington, D.C., we see an elaborate grid design. And what's the origin behind this? Well, we're told that Washington, D.C. came about due to legislation after the passage of the Constitution and the United States won the Revolutionary War from President Washington himself, who signed in legislation in 1790 that the United States was going to build its own capital. And it was going to do so in land between Virginia and Maryland. And we can see in 1790 there were existing towns of Georgetown and Alexandria. And by 1791, they had a plan for the city of Washington. And only... Ten short years later, they had the city of Washington founded or established. And then the land that it comprised was called the District of Columbia until the retrocession in 1846 when they gave the state of Virginia its land back. Lincoln wasn't happy about that, but that's how we ended up with Washington, D.C. as it is today, all in Maryland. Well, in the 1790s, President Washington was busy suppressing whiskey revolts and then defeating the Indians in the Northwest Indian War, as they were called at that time. But the plan of Washington came about from Major Peter Charles L'Enfant. He had the plan for Washington, not to be confused with the L'Enfant Reed plan from the 1970s. And it was a very elaborate layout. Look, this was the United States, and they weren't just going to settle with having a capital in an existing city. Oh, no, they were going to build a city from scratch. Because if you can't do something from scratch, it's just not worth doing. And so... L'Enfant had this very elaborate plan, and this is where we have the unique grid pattern for Washington, D.C. At least this was the genesis of it, or so we're told. And there were numerous dispositions and maps that showed us how the city was going to be laid out. So Washington sent Andrew Ellicott, a land surveyor, and he changed the plan when he looked around and saw what was going to be practicable and what wasn't going to be practicable, at least with the layout of Washington, D.C. He also had help from this gentleman, Benjamin Banneker, who was an astronomer, farmer, land surveyor, and Jack of all trades and together they went out and they looked at the land to designate what would eventually become the district of columbia and in fact you can still see the boundary stones some of them still exist to this day more of them apparently existed in 1908 and these were the stones that these two surveyors laid out to designate where the area of washington dc was going to be and in fact we have this old map from 1908 or so we're told that shows us where these boundary stones were and how they designated the original district of columbia which at that time included alexandria county in virginia and you can still go and see some of these boundary stones and they have some elaborate what almost looks to be cursive writing although it's not you can read it pretty well not that i'm making fun of who can read cursive or who can't i can't read cursive anymore i just don't see it the original federal boundary stone, Southeast 7, District of Columbia, placed in 1791 to 1792. 
So bottom line up front, what you can see is that there was a lot of work to be done from the legislation being passed in 1790 to build a national capital within 10 years. And according to our official account, that's exactly what we're told happened. President Washington signed the legislation into law and they managed to establish a city. And here we can see that Washington is sitting with Alexandria and Georgetown within the marked District of Columbia, a square area that was 10 miles by 10 miles or 100 square miles. And in more advanced maps, you can see that the District of Columbia looks like it makes a lot of sense. It's a separate geographical portion of land. Now, I have no doubt that Ellicott and all of his individuals told the president that this was going to be very difficult. You want us to build a capital within 10 years where one didn't exist on swampy land? And I'm sure that this was presented to President Washington in a very formal way and very respectful because we can see in early maps in 1792 it looks like there were some grid patterns now we'll be told that these were actually later maps and i have no doubt that when president washington was told that it was going to be very difficult or impossible he said just make it happen and when he said just make it happen we had our nation's capital although president washington didn't get the pleasure of actually residing in the white house or the executive mansion as they call it at that time he got to live in this nice place in philadelphia until they formally moved the capital in 1800 as we're told well, Washington eventually departed and moved on as president as the founding father of the United States. And after 1796, the United States was left to the other founding fathers, such as Jefferson and so forth, and engaged in the War of 1812, a not very successful war for the United States military. In fact, current retired military officers write books about how terrifying the leadership of the United States military was in the War of 1812. We already discussed the humiliating surrender of General Hull in Detroit when he commanded the fort there to a very inferior British and Native American force. But moving on, we look closer at the Battle of Stony Creek. This was an attempted invasion in Ontario by the United States military, and they were defeated by a British force, British slash Canadian force, that they outnumbered five to one. And a lot of this was due to the ineffective leadership. Now, naturally, the Canadians celebrate this by building a great monument. In Scotland, you'd probably consider this a telescope. And I guess I could see why someone might think it looks like a telescope. Parapets are very useful for a telescope. We consider the commander, Brigadier General William Winder. He was the commander at Stony Creek, along with General Chandler, and after he failed in his command, he was naturally given more responsibility to conduct the defense of Washington when British veterans after the end of the Napoleonic Wars invaded, led by British General Ross. Now, the British had a very effective campaign, and despite being on extended lines of communication and logistics, they managed to land and threaten Washington, D.C., and in the Battle of Bladensburg, they managed to defeat General Winder's command very successfully. So, once again, it was not the proudest moment for the United States Army. And there were many failures in the War of 1812, and we're told that the reason for this was because they had ineffective generals. Perhaps it was because they hadn't invented PowerPoint, or maybe because uh, General Winder hadn't married the Commandant's daughter, as West Point hadn't been established yet. Regardless, the Battle of Bladensburg was known for Joshua Barney and a contingent of U.S. Marines who fought effectively behind canyon, cannons. After they were overrun, Joshua Barney was significantly wounded and captured by the British, but they treated him well and released him. They're always wonderful gentlemen, aren't they? Those, uh, the British military. But this battle showed that uh, the United States military was not effectively led, and oftentimes, even though we thought they learned this lesson in the Northwest Indian War, that they needed a standing regular army, as the militia seemed to be unwilling or unable to invade Canada, but they were more than happy to march with President Washington to suppress the Whiskey Revolt, this led to the burning of Washington and General Ross's effective military campaign. And it should be noted that this indicates to us that in only 22 years, or actually 24 years, there was a full city established at Washington. They still have a memorial to the Battle of Bladensburg to this day, which is quite interesting, and it's celebrated by armed forces of Canada and the United States. So, you know, I guess we got past things and it all turned out like it was supposed to. The continued development of Washington involved what was called a retrocession in the 1840s, where they gave back Alexandria County to Virginia. President Lincoln didn't like this because he felt it deprived Washington, D.C. of its defensive preparations during the upcoming American Civil War. Although, Lee was always nice enough to go way around the wide flank and not march directly to Washington. Even though the Confederate Army won numerous battles, the battles of Bull Run within 30 miles of Washington. So, once again, I guess things turned out like they were supposed to. The elaborate plan and architecture of Washington shows many different details with the way the National Mall, the monuments, and everything leads up to the Capitol. Here we have the Washington Monument. We'll be taking a closer look. It was a 
obelisk, much like we saw in the Vatican. And no, this was an obelisk that we're told was built in Washington. It was not hauled from Egypt or Rome or some other exotic location. This is what the National Mall allegedly looked like in the 1860s. And we see the grid pattern with the streets and some interesting buildings that dot the landscape. Now, looking at the different conflicts, the battles of Bull Run in the Civil War, both these battles occurred only 30 miles from Washington, D.C. In fact, it's quite interesting that the Confederate Army had utterly defeated the Union Army. The U.S. Army seemed to have major issues winning battles around the District of Columbia. They lost Bladensburg, and they lost the first and second battles of Bull Run, which was, again, only 30 miles from the capital. Fortunately, the Confederates opted not to march on the capital both times. You can still see, though, that there are many indications of the architectural layout and even here in this little pattern on the street or in between the streets that show the complex pattern of layout within Washington DC. Washington DC has a political culture with it and I remember watching a rather funny puppet show in the 1980s called DC Follies. Caricatures of Washington DC have been with the United States for a long time and it's also the site of many protests and political movements because it's the capital of the United States so it all makes sense. In this particular picture, you see the layout of what we're told are many temporary buildings. This is the National Mall, and this is the area that you're supposed to focus on when you visit Washington, D.C. You have all the noticeable landmarks, the U.S. Capitol, the Smithsonian, and of course the Washington Monument. And we start with the U.S. Capitol, built in 1793 to 1800, and it's undergone numerous renovations. And throughout our state capital explorations, we see that this is the National Capital of the United States. And we compare and contrast with how it used to look, and this was the old dome that they had on it, and the capital was much smaller. Very interesting picture. I also appreciate the fact that, as always, it still has the pediment and the columns, because what else would it have? In fact, there are 22 old columns parked at a park nearby to Washington, D.C. that stood for 130 years in the old capital, but we're told that these columns didn't make do when they established the new dome, so they had to replace them, but they hung on to the old columns. Very interesting. It's almost as though there's a run on columns. Does anybody know a column manufacturer anywhere? Let me know the number or the email. I would certainly like to contact them and see if we could get some columns manufactured. Maybe just one. I don't need 22. We have other pictures that show the prominent role that the U.S. Capitol played during the Civil War. And it's rather interesting that they were renovating at that time. And I suppose that can explain all the dust and dirt that was going down. Well, we look at the Jefferson Memorial built 1939 to 1943, at the end of the Great Depression and during World War II, no less. And once again, we see a very stunning piece of architecture with a dome and numerous columns and a pediment on it, because this is for President Jefferson. The interesting historical account with the Founding Fathers of the United States is that they were geniuses who managed to establish the Constitution of the United States, and yet at the same time, now we're told that they have a conflicted historical account. Well, you see, we're always doing revisions to history and our perceptions of history. Or as Ken Burns said, we know who we are by what kind of questions we ask about history, and then what sort of conclusions we make about it. Now, I'm not implying that anybody's revising history. I'm just saying that, as Ken Burns does quite factually state, we look at it differently as our society changes. But the question we have to ask is, as our society changes, does that give us license to actually change the objective history? Interestingly enough, with the Jefferson Memorial, or monument, I've heard it referred to as both by so-called licensed historians, it's intriguing when you look at its layout and the fact that it was built during World War II. And we do have some very convincing construction photos of it, which show our modern cranes. And, of course, we know that we had heavy machinery, heavy machinery in the 1940s. when It was the end of the Great Depression and the start of World War II. And as we've known in other explorations on this channel, there are all kinds of wondrous building projects that were going on during the Great Depression. Don't worry. We've got a doozy for you in Washington when we look at the Federal Triangle. Still, though, I don't see any actual photos of column construction or the establishment of the foundation, but I can understand that. Why would anybody want to take pictures of actually building a foundation? I mean, that kind of stuff is just boring. Very interesting here how they have the terrain lined up next to the memorial, and you also see how some of these cranes function. Where are the heavy hydraulic sky cranes I thought they had at that time? Oh, well. Here's another interesting photo, and I suppose you could say that this is a great photo that shows you the construction of the dome. And by all means, if you have photos of other buildings or structures on the National Mall, let me know. Well, let's look at the Lincoln Memorial, built in 1914 and 1922. And this was built during World War I, although perhaps we have a little bit more of an explanation because 
Fortunately, most of this was built after the Federal Reserve was established, so the United States was able to properly manage its finances. And here's our one construction photo of it. And once again, I mean, we've got the scaffolding around the columns, but I would really just like to see one photo or a series of photos that show the actual building of a column. I'm sure they're out there, and if you see them, by all means, send them to me. The Lincoln Memorial is very impressive, and of course it's featured on the $5 bill, and it's been featured on the one-cent penny in the United States currency for a long time. And it designates the states and their founding dates in Roman numerals. You know, so you see a lot of analogies with Rome, and I don't even want to say the Vatican, but I may as well, because there's a lot with this Columbia that just happens to be quite similar to the Vatican. Once again, I'm sure that's quite a coincidence. Here we have uh, the former president and the first lady walking through the Lincoln Memorial, and Father Abraham there sitting in his chair looking at them. Here is the original dedication ceremony in the 1920s with President Harding after they had feverishly built this incredible memorial in eight short years. Quite an achievement. And of course, President Lincoln still sits and maintains a watchful vigil over America and its duly enforced concept of democracy. But as we well know, the United States is a constitutional republic. Of course it is. I like how President Lincoln is uh, sitting on a chair that has some rather familiar symbols on the outside of it. And of course, Frequent viewers of the channel are well familiar with those. And now we look at the Washington Monument, built 1848 to 1854. There was a pause, and then they finished it later because there was a lack of availability of funds. There was a lack of availability of materials. This is actually the original Washington Monument that was built in Maryland. Yes, quite impressive. I wonder why they just didn't settle for that as an actual monument to President Washington. Well, no matter, there were some very elaborate plans for what the Washington Monument was originally supposed to be. And we can see it wasn't just supposed to be an obelisk, there was supposed to be a little bit of a temple around it. But many people don't know there is actually a temple that was built to commemorate President Washington and his great achievements as the founding father of the United States. There are numerous construction photos of this impressive obelisk that we have from Washington, D.C., from the 1850s and onward. And during the Civil War, Things just paused and they had to change construction materials. And this is why we have two different shades of coloring within this impressive obelisk. I don't know. I mean, you know, you could just take this photo right here and say that they transported this obelisk from somewhere in Egypt or Italy and brought it to the United States on boat across the Atlantic and then had to move it across the city and then erect it. I don't know. I almost think that'd be a more impressive story. But the official account tells us that it was constructed in the same location, which in and of itself is rather unique. And it was just troublesome because of limitation of funds and building materials. It actually seems like some very practical problems one would have in establishing one of the keystone structures of the Washington and something that people associate with the National Mall. Indeed, the obelisk happens to be the main marker and seems like it was always intended to be. So, I don't know, maybe President Washington just should have told his engineers, I want that monument built by 1800, just make it happen. It's another structure that's been renovated numerous times over the years, and you can find documentation of that. So once again, it calls into question what exactly the remains of the original edifice, or the monument as it were. We have some wonderful cartoon sketches and drawings that show us how it was built. Once again, I'm surprised I didn't document that with photographs, but the ability of photography was limited. At least it was limited where it was supposed to be, and there were other issues where they could get good photographs. For example, Civil War battles. We could always get photographs of the after effects, but never a battle itself because it took a long time to pose for that camera. And here you see the more familiar skyline of Washington with the Washington Monument, the Jefferson Memorial. And then there are also photos that show when they finally established the capstone on the Washington Monument, where we have individuals just sitting around and nonchalantly finishing things. And I understand work can get a little boring. And then, of course, when they finally put the capstone on the Washington Monument, and it's indeed an iconic image. It's something that persists with Americans to remind them of the nation that they actually live in. In fact, even Spider-Man got involved with uh, toying around with the capstone of the Washington Monument. Ah, yes. Well, let's move on and look deeper. Let's look at the Smithsonian Building, also called the Castle, built 1849 to 1855 out of Seneca Redstone. Now, apparently there was a quarry nearby in the state of Maryland where they pulled out all this Seneca Redstone. Naturally, you won't find many rem remains of this quarry now, 
But it's a very impressive building material. I also find it interesting that they call this Smithsonian Institution building the castle. I guess because it looks like a castle? Well, if anybody would know, it would certainly be the people of the Smithsonian. I mean, these are legitimate historians and scientists, and they are the people who are certified to tell us what we see and to tell us when we're dealing with a conspiracy or a conspiracy theory. Very impressive building, and I have to admit the redstone is a very unique coloring that we don't see very often. We also have a very nice round window, which we may suggest deals with cymatics, but maybe it was just a pretty window. And all these large towers, oh look, I think I see another telescope. At least if you're in Edinburgh, it's going to look like a telescope with parapets on it, so you know when you stick it in your eye to look through it, it's going to puncture through your eye. Very interesting perspectives, though, of the castle, as they call it, and we can see that there's some very elaborate block work and decoration along the windows and numerous chimneys. It's an impressive structure that stands to this day, and I think it's very fitting that they have the flag of the Smithsonian on top of it. It's also unique that you have numerous towers, because what would work better for displaying the great historical achievements of the United States than having a building that looks like a castle with many towers? It's just one of those things, you know, you need to have towers so you can properly display all your historical memorabilia and your displays so people can be appropriately impressed. We do have images that were told from earlier times, 1870s, 1890s, that indicate that this castle has always been with us, and it's an impressive edifice. Here's one of the older photos, and you can see that all the towers were there. There were never any renovation, renovations needed, and if there were, it seems like we don't have any more of that Seneca redstone to build or renovate the building. And we just have to do an elaborate paint job. The interior is no less impressive, where we see our usual array of arches and columns that are all very well decorated. And you realize that you are in an exceptional building, and it's very suitable as the Smithsonian for its numerous displays. And in the different lightings, you can see that the interior has all the details that we'd come to expect in such a building that we refer to as a castle, that even the Smithsonian refers to as a castle. This kind of reminds me of many of the churches and cathedrals that we've looked at with the tight geometry here in the ceiling with all the interlapping, intersecting lines and you even have a little rotunda window there as well. And another larger portal window out front here. So could this building have had some other purpose at some point in time? Well, that's just an absurd notion. It's clear it was built from the ground up to be our display for maintaining and tracking our history through the United States development. And everyone knew that the United States was going to be a world power in the 1850s, so this building is fitting. This is Joseph Henry. He was the first secretary of the Smithsonian. He kind of looks like actor Cliff Robertson. Yes, Cliff Robertson. You might recall him from Escape from Los Angeles, where he played the president. I don't know. Give me Donald Pleasance any day, but Cliff Robertson was still a great actor. Other interior photos show elaborate columns that are well decorated along with the arches. And of course, we see the usual details in the ceilings. So if you get to Washington, D.C., make sure you see the castle. Now let's go to Washington Union Station, built 1907, and then it was rebuilt in 81 to 89. So once again, we have another great Union Station. And of course, the United States Capitol should not be without a Union Station. This is one of the original images of Union Station in Washington from the early 20th century. And this is a very impressive layout. You can see some of the details across the ceiling and look how much area that covers along with the walls. Also very intricate hallways with numerous arches and blocks. And of course, this makes sense. It's the nation's capital and you know they had no limits on funding. Granted, this was built before the establishment of the Federal Reserve. I'm not exactly sure how they pulled that off, but... I'm sure they came up with the financing, they had many donors, and you know Congress could just pass some sort of legislation, and the president could just say things are only impossible until they're not, and suddenly you've got yourself a wondrous Union Station. What's interesting, though, is the account of how this Union Station was rebuilt in 81 to 89. Now, there's conflicting accounts, and you can find some images that show that the building was in deterioration. I'm always surprised that we have to pass through this immense amount of time and allow many of these Union Stations to deteriorate. But then you have this common story of how the city, the state, the government gets involved and suddenly comes up with funding to restore this building to its once great opulence. Although I have to ask, did this opulence ever decline or was it simply the passage of time? And then with a little bit of a focus, the government was able to make things happen, bring this building back to its once greater glory. And now many of these buildings exist as exhibits, such as the one in Kansas City, or they're converted into hotels or something in between. Ah, there we go. Those impressive figures. Nothing says America like Roman centurions or Greek hoplite warriors. And we always see them adorning all the great monuments and buildings of the original United States.
There's also an interesting walkway that leads up to this Union Station, and you have to consider how many bricks they had that go into the walkways, the streets, and the approaches to all of these wonderful edifices. Once again, you can see that there's a grand gallery because it wouldn't be a Union Station without a grand gallery and a ridiculously high ceiling because, you know, you need to look up and see beauty and decorative details as you're traveling from point A to point B. It helps alleviate, um, how shall we say, psychological machinations that our busy lives can impose upon us. So you have to ask the question, well, if that really helps, then why aren't we building more Union Stations like this today? This was, I believe, called the pit area, and this was one of the targets of the major renovations of 1981 to 1989, but the surrounding area looks quite familiar to what we remember the Union Station. Another impressive one. Well, let's move on to the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, built 1871 to 1888. Now, this building had many different names, starting with the State War and Navy Building, as buildings typically do. Very intricate and unique architecture of the 19th century, where we see many small and scaled columns built on the elaborate roof, and of course many chimneys because they needed to burn many fires to keep it warm, or so we're told. Once again, we see the impressive foundation stones behind what was originally the State War and Navy Building, or the Swan Building, until it was renamed the Eisenhower Executive Building. Very impressive, and it still stands to this day. And once again, we can see the many different architectural capabilities and construction capabilities that always impress us from the 19th century within the United States. Apparently, President Nixon had an office here. Perhaps he was seeking to conceal himself after he imposed what was called the Nixon shock, or taking the United States off the gold standard. And that's quite a controversial decision. This is the one construction photo we have of the Swan Building, as it was called. I wonder what all the barrels were for. Well, it's a good thing uh, Lieutenant Commander Worf wasn't around there, otherwise a barrel might have fallen on his back. That's President Taft's cow right there. Yes, President Taft had a pet cow and apparently just had it wander around this building at that time. Another one of those interesting stories that we have that you just can't make up. The interior of this building is impressive with some beautiful skylight and some intricate details around the skylighting and the usual banister and decorations on the wall because, you know, in the 1870s and the 1880s they had all this time. Here's an older interior photo, and of course we see the usual decorated pillars and then some of the supports on the little balcony. You always need a balcony so your supervisors can walk around and make sure that you're doing the right thing, especially in the 19th century. There's many interesting accounts with this building and the fact of how it played into the machinations of the United States bureaucracy and also within the original Department of War, now the Department of Defense. Well, let's look at some temporary buildings in Washington, D.C. And because of the aforementioned world wars, uh, Washington, D.C. needed to construct many temporary buildings for bureaucratic purposes and function in a government. One of the things of knowing that a government's been around a while is that it continuously gets larger. And even though people say that they're against larger governments, somehow it just happens. Now, I'm not proclaiming that it's any sign of something bad. Here's the National Museum, the National Museum of American History, built in the 1960s. And it's the small building in front of the more impressive building behind it. I'm just going to say it's a smaller building, but it represents uh, the capabilities of 1960s, and it is not a temporary building. These are more temporary buildings. Numerous functions that were built along the National Mall, and they established it in these buildings that they removed. It's still impressive, though, that this elaborate complex of many buildings was constructed at the start of the 20th century. Now, I'm not sure exactly what to make of it. I mean, you can definitely say these are the buildings that we would think they would be capable of building at the time. And now we go to Federal Triangle. Seven of the buildings were built by the U.S. federal government in the early and mid-1930s, part of a coordinated construction plan, which has been called one of the greatest building projects ever undertaken. And this is the layout of the Federal Triangle. Very interesting that this is just right off of the National Mall, and these are some of the most impressive overall buildings that we see in Washington, D.C. to this day. In fact, that earlier building that we saw in that earlier picture, this all came as part of what was called the McMillan Plan, passed in legislation by Senator McMillan, pictured here. And of course, it's always that story. Whenever you need something done, you just pass some legislation and mountains will move. Although they passed this legislation right at the start of the 1900s, and it wasn't until the Great Depression in the 1930s they decided to develop this Federal Triangle area which we just saw, and also intriguing that they did it during the Depression. They patterned it after the Great Palace in Paris because, you know, what else are you going to build it after? Although, personally, I don't think it looks much like the palace, what they established in Federal Triangle, but, you know, maybe I'm just a little off. This is the Apex Building, and this is the building that sits at the point of the triangle, or the Apex, as it's so promptly named. 
We do have one of our rare construction photos though for this particular building and yes, it's another very convincing construction photo showing us the construction of the Apex building, or so we're told. And if you have more construction photos of the buildings in the Federal Triangle, please let me know. Now this seems to be a picture of the development of the Federal Triangle, the end of it, but I'm not really sure. There just seems to be something a little off with this particular photo. So I'm not sure if it's a drawing, a rendering, or what. And here we have what looks to be more of an actual photo, and there we see the old post office pictured at the top there with the very elaborate tower. We'll be looking a little bit more closely at that in a moment, and we can see the supposed layout of Federal Triangle. The Federal Triangle being located right off the National Mall was a target for development area, and it was supposed to be how they were looking deeper into the architectural layout of Washington, D.C. That was part of the Macmillan plan in the 1900s, and these were some of the buildings that they had within that immediate vicinity that they felt needed to be replaced, updated, and upgraded. And what better time than during the Great Depression? It's always intriguing how you have these accounts. And here's the Reagan building. Now, this is an interesting one. This is one that we're told was finished and completed in the 1980s. The rest of the buildings in Federal Triangle, either the 1930s or earlier. But looking on the interior of this Reagan building, we definitely see the signs of 1980s, post-1960s or urban renewal architecture with uh, that lovely modern look that you have. And indeed, when you look at other interiors of the Reagan building, you can see that the interior really shows you when the building was built. And it certainly reflects what the United States was going for in the times of the 1980s. And of course here. So there's no real confusing this with what we'll call the neoclassical buildings or the architectural approaches that are used in the other buildings on Federal Triangle. So a very intriguing, unique account. This is one of the very few construction photos, supposedly, that I could find of what was going on in Federal Triangle during the 1930s. Remember that during the 1930s, the United States and the rest of the world were suffering the effects of the Great Depression. But why let that stop you from the most elaborate construction project of all time? And you can see how most of the rest of the buildings from this aerial view look in Federal Triangle, with the, side, with the exception of the Reagan building, which was pictured on the left. And there are numerous photos from this particular area in Federal Triangle that show stunning architectural achievements. We have our marble granite floors, and yet you also have a mix of more modern buildings with that Reagan building. So, I don't know. It's almost more of a conflicted account with what's going on, or at least a conflicted architectural appearance. But looking at some of the older buildings, the ones built during the 1930s, that is, you see the signs of the older architecture with the tight geometry, the impressive arches, and of course the decorated pillars. We'll wait till you see how far this goes. You also have these numerous face statues. It looks like we've got uh, Poseidon here or somebody because what better shows the concepts of a constitutional republic than the pantheon of Greek and Roman gods and goddesses? Maybe this is Hera or Athena, I'm not sure. It's very impressive, and no doubt the stone or the concrete that it's built on is very impressive and will endure for some time. And, of course, we have the William Jefferson Clinton building pictured here, and this is one of the buildings that was from the 1930s, and you might have noticed by now that there's a lot of renaming that goes on Washington, D.C. Some people are in political favor, some people aren't. Of course, that part makes sense, and you know, we can always rename things to whatever we want them to be, which might tell us that the priority of name should not be considered so much, but just the structure itself. Very impressive spiral staircase here, and of course we have a very unique symbol down there at the bottom of the spiral staircase. And we always see the unique achievements with spiral staircases, don't we? Let's look at the old post office building, built 1892 to 1899. Now, at the time, other architects said that this building was a bit of an eyesore. And as you know in our other explorations, this is just the kind of building that you need for a post office. You need to have a big, huge tower with a clock on it, so even though everybody had pocket watches at that time, they could set their watches by the time. And, of course, it makes sense there. And It's a very elaborate building. And you need the most beautiful, elaborate, and complex building if you're going to sort mail effectively, especially in the 19th century. Because there was just so much more mail. You know, the internet hadn't been invented. The United States military didn't have PowerPoint to do its presentations and impress its superiors to make particular decisions. Not that I'm saying that's what actually happened. But when you consider the presence of the post office building, we have to ask, why aren't we building post offices like this anymore? Well, then the answer we'll be given is because we have the modern internet. We have modern communications. We have PowerPoint. So you don't need a big, huge gallery like this with these impressive arches. In fact, you never need to build a building like this.
And now let's look at the Andrew W. Mellon Auditorium, built in 1934. That's the impressive building in the background here behind the museum that we looked at. You can easily tell the difference between 1930s and 1960s architecture, I would say. And here we have an impressive neoclassical design with the great pediment. And the centerpiece of this pediment depicts Columbia herself. Yes, the deity that supposedly represents the United States. Not very modest, although I'll say here she's somewhat more modest than the Iowa Soldiers and Sailors Monument with its depiction of Iowa. And once again, we have the faces down here above each of the doorways depicting our pantheon of gods and goddesses, which always seems to appear. Very impressive architecture and construction, even for the 1930s. Of course, at that time, President Roosevelt had passed Executive Order 6102, which forbade the hoarding of gold and bullion, so everybody had to turn their gold into the United States government. Very impressive interior on this building. And as you saw, this was the building where NATO started. And they also celebrated the 50th anniversary of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Or in other words, the organization that many European nations are a member of, and the United States military provides the defense force. At least that's how it is in practice. And you might be talking about the legality of making it illegal for people to own gold, unless it's for a business purpose. But, you know, things in the United States, they can be legal or illegal based on executive order. Very impressive building with columns and the decorations here. And this was done in the 1930s. And this is supposedly the only construction photo we have of it. So if anybody else has construction photos of this Mellon Auditorium, please let me know. I would be delighted to see them. And here we have the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, just rolls right off the tongue, built 1920 to 2017. That's right, nearly 100 years to build this impressive basilica. And we've looked at many basilicas on this channel before. And here we can see that it has the classic dome and the very impressive tower and a large window in front of it. Now, intriguing that it took them so many years to build this building, and we referred to Executive Order 6102 earlier, and why we were referring to Executive Order is it shows how the United States government was able to generate funds even during the Great Depression. They simply made it illegal for the hoarding of gold bullion, and the gold bullion had to be turned into the United States government. So it just goes to show you, and I'm sure somebody confronted President Roosevelt and told him what he may be doing might be ill-advised, but no doubt he said that the Constitution only applies until it doesn't and executive order for emergencies makes sense. Well, ultimately he was proven right. I mean, he was elected president four times. Back to the Basilica, you can see that it has an impressive window in detail. And then, of course, the interior detail. And for some reason, this reminds me of the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis, especially with the layout in the interior with the mosaics painted. And we're probably going to be doing an exploration where we're going to consider exactly what's depicted on these mosaics because there's some very interesting images that we might think don't tend to really portray what we'd expect to be portrayed within the story of American history, whether it's Washington, D.C., Des Moines, Iowa, or wherever. The tower on this building is very uniquely impressive as well, and this almost looks like something we'd expect to see in Byzantine. And indeed, we're told that this is Byzantine and Roman revival architecture even though Byzantium was supposedly a term invented by historians and it was always called the Roman Empire, the actual capital being in what was called Constantinople or Istanbul that we just explored. I really appreciate the decorations on the dome and the cupola on top of the dome. And then of course you have subsidiary domes and towers and arches and this is a very impressive edifice. And the Pope's been here many times because it's the Basilica, and this is considered the Basilica of Catholics in America. And, of course, it's in Washington, D.C. We have looked at the National Cathedral, and we'll be doing a follow-up exploration because there's no way we're going to cover all the explorations of Washington, D.C. in one video. Ah, yes, this looks like the entire work crew that they needed for the Basilica. You can see that we have 13 individuals here, and no doubt they worked tirelessly to get this Basilica built. And I'm sure if it was only 13 or even 20, we could believe that it would take 90 to 100 years. Very limited construction photos, though, on this basilica. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that proves or disproves anything. I'm just stating that the availability of photos for such an impressive edifice is limited. So once again, if you have access or if you know archives that show better construction photos of this impressive basilica, I would be delighted to see them. And I would certainly love to show them and display them on our Reddit site so other people can see them. Because it's safe to say this is an extremely impressive basilica. And the fact that such a structure stands in Washington, D.C. and represents Catholics across the United States is impressive in, in and of itself. I didn't really mention the altar, and I wanted to mention the altar as it has a little bit of a structure over it as well. 
And when I go back to look closer at the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis, you have the same thing. So really an entire structure, a little dome that acts as an altar as well. It's very impressive and elaborate. And once again, we can see why this would be considered a true spiritual center for healing and giving glory to a divine being. Looking on the inside, though, I'm just impressed at the height of the ceilings once again and the decorations that they're able to put on there. Was it all done with mosaic painting or small bits that were established up there? The exterior of the basilica is no less impressive, along with the layout and the amount of land that it takes. And I really lament the fact that we couldn't find more construction photos. Well, to conclude the exploration, we're going to look at the George Washington Masonic National Memorial, built 1922 to 1932. It's 333 feet tall, or 101 meters. No, I'm not making that up. And this is located in Alexandria, Virginia, which used to be part of the District of Columbia, but as part of the retrocession, it was sent back to Virginia and is no longer part of the District of Columbia. Very impressive edifice here again, and George Washington was a Mason, and they decided to build a Masonic recognition to him in Alexandria, Virginia. This is supposedly the setting of the cornerstone, although I guess they didn't need to set the cornerstone until they had the entire first level completed. Mm -hmm. It's very impressive. And you can see it has a very large tower that we might think reminds us of the great lighthouse in the city of Alexandria. And we have our usual pediment and columns that make up the front entryway. It's also interesting to consider the piece of terrain that this sits on. It's a very prominent hill. And I find it interesting that it's actually located in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, the easy explanation on that is, well, George Washington was originally from Virginia, so of course they're going to put the tribute to him in Virginia, and I suppose that makes sense. But looking at different perspectives of this unique structure, I will admit that in American history, an official study of American history, for some inexplicable reason, this building doesn't seem to be highlighted. And perhaps, you know, it's because, well, the National Mall is nearby and everybody thinks of the Washington Monument, the giant obelisk. But this is an impressive structure in and of itself. And being located so nearby, I always find it interesting that they don't tend to highlight it a little bit more. Well, maybe they do. I mean, it's got a great website to it and everything else. But it's apparently been featured for many ceremonial events back at the start of the 20th century with utilizing this wonderful dedication to President Washington. And you can see here how he's venerated along with the very impressive columns. Now, apparently they brought in a lot of material for this impressive ceiling and the columns and the floor. And the reason I'm referring to this is they had so much extra material that they were even able to generously donate one of the columns to be a war memorial for American veterans. So, a very generous and altruistic construction here that pays proper tribute to George Washington. And I wonder what's the veracity of the historical account. And here's that uh, piece of the column that became a monument to the veterans. And yes, it's always interesting how the American veterans are always getting what people would say would be their proper tribute. The remnants of a column. And, of course, you see the typical symbols that we come to expect for what this structure is and what it's supposed to represent, and it is very pretty. And the hill that it sits on is no less impressive. I wonder what kind of landscaping efforts go into maintaining this every day and every year. And I'm sure that not a single minute passes where this does not look and appear pristine. Well, we also have uh, this House of the Temple, and this is a Masonic Lodge or Masonic building that's in Washington, D.C. And the reason I highlight this is, once again, this is the third building that we've come across that's patterned after the Mausoleum of Heliconarsis. Remember the Civic Courts building in St. Louis, and let's not forget the memorial that we saw in Indianapolis. So this is number three. Everybody loves the Mausoleum of Heliconarsis. Well, I hope you enjoyed this exploration. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.